he's an excellent guy, and he is also a research meteorologist at Argonne, and the author of the book that we have for sale in the lobby. So, I'm going to let you get started with a video. Thanks, Jillian. The Earth gets all of its energy from the sun, and then it returns all that energy in the form of heat back to space at night. And so, if we lost all the energy we got from the sun during the nighttime, the temperature of the Earth, easy to calculate, would be zero degrees Fahrenheit. But because we have greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, that slows down the release of the heat at night. And it traps it like a thermal blanket so that all of the heat that we got during the day is released. And because we have greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, we're able to maintain sort of a balmy 60, 61 degrees Fahrenheit global average temperature. But the real kicker for all of this is that the amount of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere is only 0.05% represented by mass. Only 0.05% of greenhouse gases is the difference between zero and 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So it shouldn't be lost to the general public that the small increase in greenhouse gases can have a huge effect on our planet's global temperature. The problem that we have having our brains around global warming and climate disruption is that it doesn't have uh, a physical face. You can see a hurricane, you can see tornadoes, you can see hail damage, you can see straight line wind damage, you can see the physical representation of the thing that's about to catch you. Yeah, you know, with climate change, it's invisible. It's something that's causing something else to happen. So when we have all these issues about not being able to create a monster that we can attribute climate change to and then focus it on that, on how we're going to fix it, it almost makes it unfathomable for the public. For example, we had a huge cold outbreak in November. And a lot of people say, well, we should go warming now. But it turns out because the Pacific Ocean was much above normal in its, in its temperature, it actually fed a typhoon with energy that allowed it to sustain itself and move further northward than we've ever seen before. It got all the way up into the Alaska region, and it actually caused the jet stream to buckle. It, it pushed against the normal weather pattern so that it made Alaska much warmer than normal. But where there's a push, there's a response. And the response was that the jet stream over the United States took a much more southern dip and it actually brought cold Arctic air across our region. It's a global event. It's not warmer here, but it was certainly much warmer in another part of the world. And that's the problem we have with climate change, that it's about the average conditions. Some of us will experience warmer, some will experience colder, but the overall combination of warm and cold, the Earth will be much warmer. At the very core of climate science, it's understanding that climate change is here. It's happening now. But the timing and the magnitude and where it will happen in any particular location at any one time is still a forecast problem. And still there are some unknowns. And climate deniers really focus in on this because they will capitalize on the unknowns. And they will eventually convince the general public that scientists know nothing about anything. That somehow we're, we're out there trying to falsify scientific and that's simply not true. Scientists themselves tend to be very skeptical. Their job really is to, to understand truth. And it's very hard because there is no book of all knowledge. So scientists come up with ideas and they vet them through what we call the scientific process. It's not good enough for a scientist to believe they are right. It's not good enough for a scientist to know they are right. Scientists must convince each other that they are right. And we do this through a process that does, has no expectation about the outcome of the ideas, but rather we remain loyal to the process.
Well, good evening. The title of my talk tonight is uh, basically what we know and don't know about climate disruption. But my title also shows global warming, climate change, and global climate disruption with sort of the last one checked. And I think this is probably a more accurate description of what science has found out over the last three or four decades about how Mother Nature will react to something we call global warming. So what I'd like to do tonight is start somewhere at the top of the where it's very simple. The Earth is a round rubber ball and work our way down to the complexities of trying to understand what climate disruption will do for where you live in your own backyard. So I, I think it's really important. I mean, we're a small enough audience. We can talk to each other here a little bit. So I encourage um, um, feedback. Um, how do scientists get the right answer? If you're taking a class at the university and you want to get a good grade in the class, you have to get the right answer. So who has the right answer in the classroom? What do you think? Yeah, professor, absolutely. And where does the professor get the right answer? You know? Well, back in high school, it was the syllabus, right? It was the teacher had this special little book that had the answers in the back of the book. But where do you think those answers come from? Research. And so, in this particular case, it's about, I wish scientists had a book of all knowledge, you know, that somehow we got a, a degree and we got the, the secret handshake to the, to the library to get the key to the book of all knowledge and go back and look up the cure for cancer or whatever it is. It just doesn't work that way. And so, scientists have ideas and the scientific um, process that we go through is putting out an idea. Here's a set of data, this is what we think is, is a hypothesis, this is what we think from this. And it's the rest of the scientific community to basically prove it wrong. And if you can't prove it wrong, it must be the right answer. It's kind of a, a way to think about it. Theories exist not because you can prove them right. It's because you can't prove them wrong. So I love this sort of quote about it. It's, it's not a good enough for a scientist to believe or know they are right. They have to convince another scientist that they are right. And that's what we call peer review. And I would put out to you that probably the scientific pr profession is probably the most reviewed, self-critical profession that's out there. And it's always changing. We just never let it go. We're just going to keep at it and keep at it until we can never find anything wrong with it. So um, it's important that when I make my talk tonight, I'm using science-based evidence. They aren't what I believe and what I know. As a matter of fact, I work for, uh, and I'll uh, talk to you about it later on, but tonight, I um, work for a user facility, a national user facility, and we've had about 5,000 scientists come through the facility. And their job is to communicate to me to tell them what kind of observations that they need to do their experiments. And my job is to make sure that I can give them what they want. But the deal is that, that after they do their experiment, they're supposed to tell me, write up a little one-page summary so that I can understand what science they found. And so tonight, my story is not just my story. It's not the research I'm doing. It's the story of 5,000 scientists that have gone through our facility in the last 24 years. So let's start. The Earth is a round rubber ball. It's a big picture. So where do we get all of our energy from? The sun. The sun. Very good. And so basically the sun sends down its radiant energy, comes down and strikes the Earth, and gets returned back to space as heat. OK? Pretty simple. And so as a, in the video, it's pretty interesting. We can calculate if we know the sun's radiant energy, we can measure what hits the Earth. If it all goes back up to space and the, and the atmosphere had no greenhouse gases in it at all, if the atmosphere was completely what we call transparent, just put all that energy back in space, it's pretty easy to calculate that the Earth's average Earth temperature would be zero degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty cold. But we have these things called greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and that traps the heat. And so it slows down the planets getting rid of the heat at, at basically at nighttime. And so the difference of, and, and that keeps the planet about a balmy 60 degrees Fahrenheit. But the only difference is that by mass, there's only 0.05%, 0.05% of by mass of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. That 0.05 is the difference between zero and 60. And so that's a small amount of number. If you only got 0.05% in your, in your savings account, you'd move it, okay? Small number. And that's what the whole climate issue is about. Because we can look back over the last uh, 20 or 30 years of the greenhouse gases that are in our atmosphere. And there's about a dozen of them that really do the bulk of, of keeping our atmosphere warm. And you can see in this graph that each, 
Each of the different colors represents methane, another greenhouse gas. But from 1970 to 2005, this was out of the, Illinois, uh, the uh, International Panel on Climate Change report, you'll see that the bands at, near the top are all kind of the same thickness over the time. That means that they've not increased over two and a half decades. But you'll notice the one in red here, which adds the bulk to the total amount of greenhouse gases, that red one is the one that's changed significantly over the last 25 years. And it turns out that that um, red color there, that greenhouse gas is, is due to carbon dioxide produced by the burning of fossil fuel. Now there's a pretty good biological study about this because it turns out how do we know that the carbon dioxide is from the burning of fossil fuel? We breathe, plants breathe, I mean, where's the carbon dioxide coming from? And it turns out that, uh, this is what I learned, there's about 15 different kinds of isotopes of carbon. Three of them occur naturally, carbon 12, 13, and 14. 12 is the one that's on the periodic chart, it's the most abundant. Uh, carbon 14, boy, that's the one we use for carbon dating. Everyone knows it's got a slow radioactive decay, so we use that for dating old things like dinosaurs, or my first birthday. And it turns out that the carbon 13 is kind of unique for plants. Plants use carbon-13. So when plants die and they go to a goopy mess we call oil, or they go to a solidification of a goopy mess called coal, if you burn that oil and you burn that coal, you get carbon-13 carbon dioxide. And scientists can measure the ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12. And what this shows is the ratio of carbon to 13, it's growing, it's contributing. And that's what correlates to what we would call global warming. That's how we can go back and science can say that it's carbon dioxide for the burning of fossil fuels that's contributing to the increase in greenhouse gases. Now, I don't necessarily know where all those, uh, where all the carbon, who's burning it, whose fault it is or anything like that. I just know it's due to the burning of fossil fuels. So, we can, then this is where we, we talk about scientists saying that 97% of the scientists agree that the earth is warming. That's it, right there. We could stop the discussion in the presentation right there. But remember, that's earth is a round rubber ball. What we want to know is what's going to happen because the earth is getting warmer, and we want to know where it's going to happen and when it's going to happen. And that's still a forecast for science. So here's the problem. It would have been really nice if we had been studying um, our planet's climate, or even another planet's climate, but we, we haven't. So don't we, we don't have another example in the universe to go back and say, well, what's it like at Mars? If we track that back a million years, can we predict what Earth is going to be like? We don't have a model. So to understand how our system works, we have to gather information. We have to start kind of at square one. So the problem is, is that for climate, if you want to know the resolution that the Earth is around a rubber ball, but you want to know at the county level or something at the order of my backyard, it's going to take a lot of data. The complexity is huge, and we have to be able to tell the computers which order to crunch different, different types of biological and chemical and atmospheric processes in what order to understand how Mother Nature works. And when we do this, we've estimated it takes at least 12 orders of magnitude in temporal and spatial range to understand climate. The, Earth, uh, the, the, the energy of the sun comes in photons. They're, they're on the micron level. But the Earth's atmosphere works on meteorological systems that go up to 10,000 kilometers in space in time. And so we have to be able to, whatever's right, needs to transcend 12 orders of magnitude in time and space. If we get it right today, it has to be right a million years ago. And then we'll have confidence that it'll be right into the future. So it's a huge problem. So where do we get the data? This is the program that I was telling you about. It's called the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Program, or ARM program. And basically, um, what I want to say from the slide is it's not like your typical user facility where you have a beam line and you're doing a physics experiment inside of a building. Basically, we take our instruments to the field. We try to put our instruments at places around the world where we need to get long-term data so that modelers that are testing all these different computational algorithms and scientific ideas that we have, where do we go to places where the models and the observations don't agree? That's where we want to be. We want to see where are we getting it wrong. 
And so these, these polka dotted map, basically we have three permanent sites, one in the Arctic, one in the middle latitudes, the United States and the Southern Great Plains, and the sites that are circled in the tropical Western Pacific. And those are the three permanent sites. They've been there for 20 years of taking 24 hours a day, seven days a week, real-time quality assured data that we can provide scientists for all the measurements they want. And they're not fancy measurements, they're just about temperature, weather, humidity, pre precipitation, cloudiness, the strength of the sun, all that kind of stuff. And we do that everywhere we see on these little dots by taking, we, we developed a mobile facility. We can take the same instruments that we go in the permanent regions, pack them up in 10 tractor trailer trucks worth of, worth of uh, data, I mean, uh, instruments, pack them on a 747 aircraft and fly in some place and negotiate with countries to park it there for a year and a half and take data. And so each one of these dots on the map represent a scientific question that, that a person, that a scientist wrote that said, hey, here's a scientific question we have. If you put your mobile facility there for two years, we can answer this question. And so it's pretty cool. We've gotten to some places like in Point Reyes, California, if you've ever been there. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's, it's the foggiest place in all of North America, <laughs> okay? And it turns out that there's so many hundred days a year that it's always foggy. But we've learned over the last 30 years that the amount of fog has dissipated. The, su the sun is getting through to shine and it's making brighter at the surface, which means it's heating up the surface. So what's changing? Why is it doing that? It's important because there's a lot of coastal regions around the globe that have the same problem. And it turns out, it sounds simple, but we, we did a scientific experiment, that the fog is nothing more than a cloud. And it turns out that what was happening is that the pollution from the California area would get over the oceans, it would kind of cook for a couple of days, go from gas to aerosols, particles. These particles would be blown in into the to the uh, fog, it'd be like cloud seeding. The particles went in there, it caused the cloud matter, the droplets to, to form on them, and then they would rain out. It made the cloud thinner. So it's, it's a kind of an e neat explanation, but it's because of the different uh, pollution from the United States, not necessarily from burning a fossil fuel, but as a contributor to it, how it was affecting clouds. We went to India, it's kind of an interesting story there, that we learned that, the, um, that really the biggest question in, in looking at models right now for climate is understanding clouds, which are like umbrellas, thermostatic regulators to your planet, planet, and aerosols, which tend to cool the planet. How do, these, how do you work these into the models? That's kind of a tough one. And we've looked at um, uh, clouds and they're pretty hard. It, it turns out that um, basically high clouds tend to warm the atmosphere and low clouds tend to cool the atmosphere. That's almost counterintuitive, but that's what we've learned. Another thing is that aerosols tend to cool the atmosphere. If we have volcanic eruptions, it certainly shields us from the sun. But at the same time, we learned that those little buggers have chemical composition that cause some problems. So for example, it's just not an aerosol that's maybe deflecting the sun's uh, sunlight, uh, but it's also the fact that it's chemical, if it's carbon in nature, black carbon or brown carbon, the sunlight is absorbed by that aerosol. It actually warms that aerosol and the atmosphere. And it turns out one of the biggest problems that India and Asia have is that we see from satellite pictures that these monsoons that come into the continent are, are bright from the satellite pictures, meaning that, boy, they, they've got a lot of rain underneath. And when they come over to, from the ocean to the land, they're supposed to heat up and get more vigorous and, and give even more precipitation. That's how that part of the world gets their fresh water. But it turns out with the sensors that we've had underneath measuring the amount of rainfall coming from them, it's becoming less and less and less every year. The fresh water supply is a third what it used to be in China over the last 10 years. That's a problem. And so what's causing that? It turns out that we went to India with our mobile facility because the black carbon actually, if it's in the upper part of the atmosphere, would cause the upper part of the atmosphere that's normally cool to warm. As it warms, it makes it more stable. And so when these monsoons came on land, they didn't get invigorated and grow and dump more rain. They just kind of got kind of lazy. And it changed their structure a little bit, but it didn't give them any more rain. But it changed it. It, it didn't change what the satellite picture looked like. So it's not enough just to get pictures from satellites. You have to understand what we call the dynamics, the thermodynamics. Everything is making the cloud to be a cloud. And these are the things we have to understand how clouds around the world will be affected because they're the ones that are regulating our climate and aerosols. It's really cool. We thought that aerosols had the biggest effect just by themselves. It turns out that aerosols have a bigger effect on clouds 
than aerosols have on the climate in general. Kind of weird, so they're kind of related. So we do a lot of experiments like that, and that's where the information comes from, really, for tonight's talk, some of the little tidbits. And so uh, models, what are models? Um, basically, we want to be able to take a global model. We can divide the, the, the globe into what we call pixels, you know, a lot of <laughs> little spaces where we can do mathematical computations. And the thing it is, if we want to know what those mathematical computations are on smaller and smaller and smaller scales, down to the, to the local where we live, then we really have to know the processes really well. And so we put those processes into the climate models and we see how well, as science, what we're learning. How well can we predict what's going to happen? And then if we do this for 30 years of measuring data, we can go back and start the models 30 years ago and, and run them forward 30 years and then go back and have the actual data to validate how they did year by year by year by year. And that's sort of the relationship between observations and science and models. So as you can imagine, the world is a round rubber ball. It's a pretty simple picture, but now we get down to where we live. And if I live somewhere down here, all these different complicated processes are, are going on, not only in the atmosphere, but also oceans, glacial systems, biological systems, terrestrial ecology. And so all of these things, it's just not an atmospheric problem. It might be making the atmosphere warmer, but it interacts with the rest of the planet. So we need to know, and we'd like to know, what's going to happen where we live, since we all don't live in average. Whoa, I just did something terrible here. How did I do that? That's what, I, that's what I'm trying to do, but it's, wait a minute, wait, I can do this. There we go. <sighs> oh, but now it won't go at all. Okay, I need your help. What did I do wrong? I froze it. I want, now I can't get the slide to go at all. Thank you. <laughs> Technology and old age don't go together too well. <laughs> so basically, um, global warming, that's where we started. Global warming is where we thought we were 30 years ago. And on the global scale, increased greenhouse gases can result in an average warming of the, of the Earth. But when we started running our models to look what's going to happen, we found out that it wasn't temperature that was the biggest outcome of the model predictions. It was changes to precipitation patterns and sea level rise were more likely of a problem in the next 50 to 100 years than temperature. We went, whoa, what happened there? So our current thinking is maybe climate change will manifest, or global warming will manifest itself as is more in extreme weather events, increased weather events, increased extreme weather events. And so maybe we shouldn't think about it as global warming because the atmosphere is going to warm, but as a result of the atmosphere warming, it's going to affect weather patterns. So we thought, well, maybe we should think about it in terms of climate change. So basically, what's the difference between global warming and climate change? Well, increasing greenhouse gases will lead to a warmer atmosphere, but the Earth is not planet. The wind blows, the Earth rotates and revolves around the sun, all those types of things. And, and that warm air is not just sitting in one place. It's actually moving around. It's coming in contact with ice. And it's gonna, some of that heat's going to be transferred to melt the ice. Some of that heat's going to be taken by the ocean. How many people got outdoor swimming pools like in, the, in your backyard? Okay, how long does it take to heat that sucker up in the summertime? If you don't have a pool heater. <laughs> it takes a long time. That's because the heat capacity of water is so huge that it takes a lot of energy of the sun just to heat it up a small amount. So that's why you put a thermal blanket on it, to really encourage it to get going. So if the Earth had a lot of heat in its atmosphere, one place you could get rid of it very quickly is in the oceans. The ocean can take a lot of heat out of the atmosphere. It will lower the atmospheric temperature, but it doesn't create a huge warm ocean one-to-one. -one. It takes a lot more energy to heat up the ocean, but the ocean will warm up. So it's not a, 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 a static system. It's always changing. So uh, the difference between climate and weather. So climate is usually defined as a 30-year average of weather where you live. It turns out it was the World Meteorological Organization that met back in the 1900s and said, you know, we've got weather stations all around the world. It would be nice to standardize the information, you know, temperature and all the things that are characteristic that the weather guys measure and be able to 
sort of where you live, understand what a 30-year average of that looks like. So I take an hourly temperature for the next 30 years in, in, in the Calb, and then I can go back and plot that and take an average and see what the average daytime high and low would be for temperature. As a matter of fact, that's what you hear at night when the weatherman tells you, uh, or the weather person, I should say, tells you whether or not you know, it was above normal or today's temperature was below normal. The climatic average is normal. It's what you expect. The weather is just sort of a little deviation around that average. That's what you get. So you can think about it that way. But another way is that the variance in the weather, the de departure from the, the highs and the lows, are typically kind of statistically you can compute them. As long as the climate isn't changing, that's a pretty well-known issue. And so if the climate is changing, one of the things, one of the ways we can think about climate is it constrains the weather. So suddenly if the climate is changing, all of a sudden there's nothing holding back constraining the weather. It can behave any way it wants to. So what does that mean? This was my favorite thing. Boy, I took statistics in college, and that was my least favorite course. I got to tell you, you know, I was, I was a physics major, but statistics, for me, they were just a form of torture for numbers. And basically, numbers are wimpy. So if you torture them long enough, they'll tell you anything. And so I had a hard time with statistics. But one part of statistics was easy for me to understand, and that's what we called a normal distribution. So if you go out and take a sample of whatever, and you plot it, you would probably see that, that most of the observations fall in the middle. And as you get off into the extremes, the occurrence of, a, of an unusual size, if you're measuring sizes of tractor trailer trucks, you know, one's longer than the other, some are smaller. But at some point, you know, you found the biggest one and you found the smallest one, OK? But imagine this to be a plot of 100 years of daily rain events. It doesn't really look like that. Just use your imagination. Let's just say I collected rain events. And, and so what I could do is statistics that based on statistics of a normal distribution, I could compute the occurrence of the 100-year flood. If I took 100 years of data, rain data, and I plotted it up, it's, it gets technical here. It says the 100-year flood is defined as the 1% or less exceedance probability of the occurrence of a single weather event bigger than the 100-year average. So to give you an example, um, some scientists at the Illinois State Water Survey did a study of a particular rain gauge in Chicago. And they, they plotted 150 years of hourly rainfall data, or daily total data, uh, rainfall data in, in Chicago. And for the first 130 years, they found that there was only one occurrence of a 100-year flood in 130 years worth of data. Well, that's pretty reasonable. But then in the next 10 years, they found one occurrence of a 100-year flood but it occurred in 10 years. In this last, most recent 10 years, they found five occurrences that exceeded the 100-year flood. And so what that's telling us is that, that the 100-year event is happening far more frequent than 100 years would predict from the data. So that tells us that the data is no longer constrained or behaving in a normal, predictable pattern. So that's sort of a backdoor argument for the climate must be changing because our weather is no longer predictable or as predictable as it used to be. So one of the ways to look at this is go back and look at what NOAA puts out every year. What are the extreme weather events that happened? This is in 2014. And if you've been paying attention to the news, you'll hear about the wildfires out in California. Uh, NASA just reported that, um, that based on the satellite data they have, that California is going to run out of natural rain or drinking water in one year. Whoa. We've also heard about floods. We've also heard about um, the Dust Bowl that's uh, forming in the, in, the, uh, in, in the Southern Great Plains. We've certainly had some wild <laughs> winter. You know, we had 92 inches of snowfall, what, two years ago. It was our worst winter ever, right, for almost snowfall. Well, second worst. And then this year, New England had 92 inches of snow in just three weeks. They had what we had at our worst year, and they had it in three weeks. That seems like an extreme event to me. And so, the point of this map is to show you that what are the odds of having a 100-year extreme event happening this frequently, not only in the United States, but around the world? Boy, I'll tell you what. Go buy a lottery ticket if you believe that this is true. It just means that we're, we're seeing that it's likely that the weather is changing dramatically to the ch in response to a changing, changing climate. Now, if that isn't enough, um, I did go back and say, well, you know, 
This year, this year was one of our coldest, it was our, it was our warmest planet average temperature, but one of the coldest seasons in Chicago. And so you might want to know where was it warmer? Well, these are some of the places that was warmer, but I'm a visual guy. This was the month of February of 2015. The blues and the purples represent where it's really cold below normal, and the reds and the yellows represent where it's above normal. I was just proud to say we're from the Chicago area and we're keeping the climate, uh, the global temperature down in, in Chicago. So the joke is, where is it warmer than Chicago? You know, where, where is your warm weather? Everywhere but in Chicago, okay, or in the, in, in, in the eastern half of North America. So again, climate is it's, it's a matter of perspective. And again, I'm sort of like visual pictures. Um, <laughs> you get it? I mean, it's a matter of perspective. The ship is sinking, but, uh, oh, it can't be sinking. My end in the bow and the stern just rose 200 feet. Well, the whole ship's going down. So it's a matter of perspective. And so there are other ways to look at perspective. You know, global warming can mean, and climate change can mean getting extreme snowfall events, extreme ice events, uh, extreme really cold days due to uh, wind chill factors. Um, here was a, a farmer that decided after, you know, many years of repeated flooding that maybe it was something Sometime, uh, you know, time to do something about it. Um, this used to be a fertile farmland. Um, unfortunately, we, the, the studies indicate that we're going to get uh, not more hurricanes, uh, but more intense hurricanes. Unfortunately, it's the same with tornadoes. Um, I felt somewhat uncomfortable making this presentation after the events of last night. I used to be a storm chaser, and I'm bound to be respectful of, of what happened around here last night. But we can expect, with climate change, not more tornadoes, but more intense tornadoes. Certainly more heat waves, more, more wildfires, because we have more droughts. And you know, if you're a detective and you look, um, I prided myself. I built my house, uh, my wife and I, 29 years ago in Homer Glen, Illinois. And we wanted to put all native plants in there, native trees, native grasses, native everything. And it turns out that this year, that the village had to come along and take out two of my uh, uh, green ash trees because of the emerald oil ash borer. Well, why? Because our climate, even though it was colder the last two years, has been warmer for seven years before that. Our cold Chicago temperatures kept bugs out that, was, that actually kept diseases from affecting our trees. So if it gets warmer, it's going to happen. We're going to get more diseases, more bugs, more things. And so our, our native species won't be so native anymore. So even the term climate change can be misleading because the impact of climate change has deep roots. It's certainly not just about weather, but it's also about health. It's about politics. It's about economy. It's about um, biodiversity, freshwater decline. It's about a lot of different things. I think you can see that it starts anything that depends on weather kind of kind of has has roots and dependency on, on a stable climate. And so when you look about this, uh, think about it in terms of our, our, our animal friends and even human health. I think the scariest part is that the International Panel on Climate Change estimates that about a third of the plant and animal species evaluated so far in climate change to studies are at risk of extinction. And another way of putting it, I mean, not to try put gloom and doom, but if you have kids, show your kids what the coral reef looked like because it won't be there when they're showing their kids the coral reefs. Oh, it's my next slide. So, so one of the biggest problems is, is, is that it's not so much the air, the threat to ocean diversity is huge. It turns out that about 93% of the Earth's heat is actually being taken up by the oceans. And when it, when it gets warmer, it allows more carbon dioxide to dissolve into the ocean, but then that makes it more acidic. And it becomes more acidic, it bleaches the coral reefs. So it's, 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 as you begin to see, it's a, it's a cascading problem. Climate change changes one thing that affects another thing that affects another thing that eventually has a huge impact on the rest of us. So maybe climate change, it's kind of funny, my wife's a preschool teacher, so we always talk about positive mental attitude. And so the idea is that we want to say that not all change is bad. Dad's going to move. We're going to have to move from here, and we're going to go to some other place. And everybody cries, because the first thing is, what's wrong about moving? You know, 
what's wrong about change. We always work on that list before what's good about it. And so we work hard to, to have a positive mental attitude about change. Not all change is bad. But I think in this case, climate change is the wrong message if you think it's not bad. So scientists now are thinking, well, maybe we really should call this climate disruption because disruption seems to be more of what's really going on than global warming or climate change. So what are we going to do about it? Well, there's lots of things we can do about it. Clearly, we can look for alternative clean energy sources. I mean, it's nuclear, it's biomass, solar, geothermal, water, all that type of thing. Um, uh, you know, we didn't start out, um, it wasn't a, a, a devious plot that, uh, that the world would be destroyed by burning of fossil fuels. I mean, who knew? And so now that we're more observant about the types of fuels that we understand um, might have effluents and, and byproducts, by developing good climate models, we can be able to say, well, what happens if I put CO2 in the atmosphere? What happens if I double this or triple that? We can look at what would happen in 100 years instead of just living that 100 years and finding out it's going to be bad. So certainly changing the fuels to, to look at other things that are more green friendly. And then, of course, the energy pyramid. I mean, there's ways that we can conserve energy. So where do we put our investments? Well, we can do more research. We can uh, do bio and geoengineering experiments of mitigation. I mean, an example might be to figure out some way that we can make more clouds or, or put more aerosols into the atmosphere to somehow block the sun's radiant energy. But we're kind of using the world as, as a laboratory. Um, the other is, is adaptation by engineering. Well, we can build bigger seawalls, but if you melted all of the ice in the planet that would contribute to sea level rise, the oceans would rise 220 feet. So the next time you're driving down Lakeshore Drive, I want you to count up 22 stories. That would be the new level of the water on the planet. So certainly we can endure the impacts, but even that has a price to pay. Um, research. Well, I, I guess I'm biased because that's what I do, but my question is, gee, do we have enough time to figure out the answers? You know, Mother Nature's just cooking along there, and, and if some of the climate disruption true, it might be accelerating faster than 100 years, we have time to figure out what are the, the, the right solutions. And certainly there's a cost for solutions. I mean, um, it's interesting to know that $2.5 billion was spent for the total budget for the U.S. Um, Global Climate Research Program, GCRP. $2.5 billion. That was across all nine federal agencies that fund climate research. The event that took place in, North, uh, in, in New England over the winter, they got that 100 inches of snow, basically they lost in just those two winter events, it was estimated they lost $2 billion in, in wages and lost sales. So there's a lot of those things going around the world. You know, what does it cost? Well, research costs money, but so do the, the, the cleanup of, of disasters with hurricanes and, and the like. So I'm not an economist. That's not my level of research. But clearly, it's all connected. It's not just a simple problem. We would have figured that a long time ago. So I don't want to leave you with it's not all gloom and doom. Uh, certainly, from my perspective, is we can all learn about what is happening to our climate. And, and, and if we all have some awareness of it, it's hard. We have busy lives. But if we understand what's going on there, we can make smart choices. Just that simple. And basically, understanding through research and accurately modeling how Mother Nature works, well, that's going to improve the forecasting. That'll improve our accuracy of what we think is going to happen in the next 50 to 100 years. And that gives us the opportunity to really address how we're going to fix it. And certainly, there's always the unknown unknowns um, that, sure, Something might be discovered by one of you sitting in there or one of your children that will be the next major cure for climate change. I have to account for that technological advance that we just don't know about to solve the problem. And also because this is a STEM event and, and education is really important to me, um, STEM is really important to me in several reasons. Boy, when I went to school, you, know, you did math, you did English, you did whatever. But, they, but it was never connected to me. And now what I find exciting about education is, is that it's, it'd be really cool to get a student interested in a problem, a real world problem like climate change. And instead of memorizing or learning about a problem that's already discovered by a scientist, wouldn't it be cool to be shoulder to shoulder with K-12 kids that haven't been biased by the education system yet and, and to give them a real world, real world problem of climate change and learn about the problem and then master the tools that they need to solve the problems. That's what makes learning mathematics fun. My kids always ask me, why do I learn math? Well, 
it's pretty exciting. If you have a problem you really want to solve, you'll learn how math can help simplify. For and it's always better to have a purpose to learn math than just to learn an equation. So I'm excited about the fact that the next generation science studies for K through 12 that starts in 2016-17 school year will be incorporating um, climate change. So we're going in the right direction, I think, even with, with education. So I'm very excited about that. And so um, thanks for hanging in with me. Uh, that's the last slide, and I will be glad to answer any questions that you have. Or there's cookies. <laughs> well, if you'd like to go to the reception area, I'm, I'm shamelessly here. I should say this, that, um, that uh, Seth Darling and I wrote a book about climate change, and, and we always got heckled by an audience that, that we knew were the climate than I are saying, well, what about this? You know, the sun was not always as bright as it is. What about this and that? So we always got embarrassed because we thought, well, we don't know all the arguments. And so that pregnant pause that we have sort of gave the denier kind of credibility. You know, we're, we're the expert. I'm not quite the expert. You have to drive 50 miles to be an expert. You have to be more than 50 miles from home. I almost had to drive around the block three or four times to make 50 miles here today. But the issue is, is that, you know, you don't know everything. And so some of these people would give arguments. And so we just got tired of that. And we said, you know what? So we wrote a, a, a book on the 15 of the most popular climate denier kind of arguments that are out there. And we debunked them. But we did it in English. We expected it to be sort of a, a dinnertime conversation. You know, it's, it's Thanksgiving, it's Easter, it's Christmas, whatever it is. And you're sitting there and you've got the family, then you just pick a conversation. What about that climate change? Well, it was a way to kind of, in English, no equations, no fancy graphs, kind of arm you with the information that you could have a, a good conversation about, about climate. And you're learning about it uh, along the way. And um, let's see, I'm supposed to say the book doesn't express the views of Oregon National Laboratory, the Department of Energy, where I work. But um, I think it's a pretty cool book because it's, it's down to earth, it's in chapters, it's simple, and my daughter illustrated the pictures. And she works for a child, uh, children's publication. Um, so it's, 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 it's meant to be um, not for scientists. It's meant to be for general public. So if we retire back to, to um, the reception area, we could, we could, I, I'd be glad to talk with you one on one. Oh, sorry, question. Kyoto uh, Protocol, which they thought was make it a, a financial thing of the world. If you could put uh, money and profit from it, let's try this. Well, it didn't work very well. Um, you think, can you profit from climate change? It didn't work as well as expected because everybody has to buy into it, and the United States didn't buy into it. Um, and that's not a political judgment. I mean, there's reasons for that as well. Um, I get this question a lot, what do you do about it? And, and, and I will say from my personal viewpoint, not, not those of others, but I would tell you that, you know, as science we used to lobby Congress to get money for our federal funding, that's where the research comes from. Well then, then we started to lobby lobbyists so they could be more professional at it. But we've come to learn over the last couple of years that, you know where that money comes from that we do research with, do you know? Income taxes. <laughs> Part of that, a little tiny part that you pay for taxes goes to fund federal research programs. And so I would rather lobby you as the provider of the funds for me. I have an obligation to tell you what, you're, what we're doing. And I guarantee you one letter from you to your congressman is gonna be a whole lot more than me going in front of Congress and doing something. So I'd rather lobby the public. You have an incredible amount of power for just an individual person if you collectively decide you are not going to put up with climate change. There's something that can be done, and we've got to have to change it. If we know it's greenhouse gases, what are we going to do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Well, we can get electric cars, but that means we all have to drive electric cars. <laughs> you know, um, there's a commitment on everybody's part. Um, but there's lots of different things that you can do. Turn out the lights at night. I tell it to my kids, turn out the lights. You'll save the planet. Um, so there are things we can do, but the idea is if we know what the problem is, you can begin to see what you can do in your own world. In, in the space that you live in, the things that you can afford to do. What do you think of, of divesting? Um, I know that the Harvard for instance, they spend all their pension funds or whatever, um, uh -huh. other fossil fuels. 
Sure, yeah, they're doing that. Yeah, uh, uh, great, uh, choice funds. Yes, you're right. There's lots of things you do. Great. It's because we understand that, that um, the burning of carbon dioxide is, is, is fossil fuels is a problem. But, but, you know, my mom had always told me, when you're pointing your finger at somebody, three fingers are always pointing back. So I can blame the power company, but the power company's only given me the light that I want to have for keeping my lights on at night or, or, or charging my smartphone or, or, or running my computer. So, I mean, so we ask for electricity. So, I mean, who, who, who is responsible for it? some ways we all are. Maybe some more than others, but we can start with what are we responsible for? Or we can organize and, and decide what are, what are better things to do about it. Yes? What do you think about the emphasis on mitigation at this point in... Boy, it's really tough. The question is, is what do I think about mitigation versus pretty smart guy. He said, money is like manure. You've got to spread it around to do any good. And I would say it's the same thing. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. I would say there's lots of different ways to look at it. I wouldn't put all your funding in one solution. I would look at different solutions. So uh, we were talking earlier about it would be really cool that if we could geoengineer uh, um, a potato plant that would grow and suck all the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and grow giant potatoes that could feed world, ha world famine, right? I mean, Okay, so the hard part is doing this in a lab. You can show it could be done, but how do you do that on a, on a global scale? I mean, that's the challenge, whether it's adaptation or mitigation. But, th that's, but that's where young minds are probably better thinking of that than, than old biased minds. Yeah, we have. I mean, you talk about the Milankovitch cycles and so forth. Actually, we talk about that in the book. It's one of the interesting things that the sun does go through cycles. It goes through about every 11 years, it gets brighter and dimmer. And then every 100,000 years, because the planet takes uh, a longer course, we're either further, away from, uh, further away from the sun or closer. And we can go back and look at ice core samples and look at this pretty closely. And what we found is that, that in the case of temperature and carbon dioxide back to a million years ago, we found that um, the sun's brightness did change, but we found that the first thing was that the temperature of the Earth changed and then the carbon dioxide responded. It's on now, we're this first time in, in the history of the planet where the carbon dioxide is driving the temperature first. In other words, the carbon dioxide is increasing and the temperature is lagging. So that's how we know in that particular day it was due to sun's invariant behavior, which it happens every couple hundred thousand of years. But um, right now, we're actually in a minimal of the sun's radiant energy, and yet we're global warming. And uh, the only cause that science can find that, that explains all the problems that we find is the increase of carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. It's a great question. Are there any theories that climate change deniers hold that do hold any kind of ground? Haven't found one yet. Um, I'm sure there's some are out there. Usually what they suffer from is what we call cherry picking data. They'll find an example of a glacier that melted that wasn't due to global warming. Okay, you can find certain examples. I'll give one, like, like there are some glaciers that if you're near a copper smelter that the ash coming from the copper smelter puts dirt onto the bright, you know, sunny, clear, white, reflective surface of the sun. So if, if you, uh, the ice, and, and, and so the sun absorbs uh, the sun rays are absorbed by the ice with, with dirt on it, so it helps melt it quicker than if the dirt wasn't there. But for every glacier you find like that, you can find a thousand more <laughs> that, that aren't explained by that. And when you look at satellite photos and the shrinking of, of the uh, ice shields and so forth, it, it, it's, it's unmistakable that it's, it's due to either the warming of the ocean melting the ice below or, or the atmosphere that's warming the ice and it's, it's sliding off, off the off the, uh, the land surface, yeah. Yes? I'm a scientist, so I don't like to try to get off into speculation that it kills my career, but <laughs> <laughs> Since we're all friends here, I would say there's a parallel kind of story that you can look from the cigarette industry 
trying to show that smoking doesn't cause cancer. You, there, there are scientific studies that they claim that would show that, that, um, that smoking is not the only cause of lung cancer and try to somehow um, uh, upset most of the evidence that suggests that it is by, by trying to put a shred of doubt. Right, so you can find those examples, but those examples, if you looked at them and used science-based evidence, you could, you could show that um, they're what they call cherry-picking the data. They're just picking the data they want. Scientists, when we collect a data set, boy, we're just anal retentive as hell. It's like a shotgun pattern. You want to draw a line through there, and if I just threw out this one little data point, I could, I could make this line, oh, it looks so much better. You can't do that. You have to justify to others why you're not going to include that data point. So that's why it's very powerful to go through the scientific process. You can, just can't toss it because it doesn't agree with your, your ideas or beliefs. Yeah. Great question, though. And, and so you can, there's a similar argument. I mean, who would not want climate change? I mean, who would not want the, the uh, fossil fuel industry to change? Yeah. I heard a, a really interesting thing the other day. Um, it's on NPR. National Public Radio, and it said that there are now more workers working in industry providing solar panels for residential areas than there are coal miners. If you remember, they said, oh, it's going to cripple the coal mining industry and people are going to lose their jobs or upset the economy. Well, for every, you know, something changes. I mean, yeah, there's evidence that that argument is not true. Hey, let's go have some cookies. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you.